And just first of all, just you know, tell us who you are and what yeah, you do. Phil, Phil Robertson, a professor in the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences at Michigan State. Um, and you'd like me to talk about the CO2 fertilization in crops. Yeah, Phil, you you, uh, you took us on a little uh, uh, trip around your experimental plots last night uh, or yesterday, and we were looking uh, at a lot of pretty dry uh, ground out there. And we're in the midst of a, a bit of a drought here in southwestern Michigan. Uh, and so the, the question of what's going to happen to agricultural production in coming years is a big one. And we have one of the talking points that we often hear is that CO2 is going to have a fertilization effect on uh, agricultural crops, so we're going to get more. Uh, but at the same time, we know it's going to get hotter and there's going to be more extreme events. So how do we, how do we parse all those influences going right. forward? Well, you're right in that. It is a, it is a question of balancing the interactions and understanding the interactions. And the CO2 fertilization effect in annual crops uh, is real. Is CO2 will fertilize and some annual crops more than others, uh, unlike in natural ecosystems. And that's because in native ecosystems, uh, productivity is typically nitrogen limited, whereas in cropping systems, nitrogen is added uh, as a fertilizer, and so CO2 is allowed to uh, effectively uh, increase productivity for some crops. Now, crops differ in their a response to fertilization. Some crops like corn will respond very slightly uh, with a yield increase of around 1% perhaps uh, for another 50% increase in CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. Soybeans and wheat on the other hand will increase their productivity on the order of 5 to 10%. Now that has to be counterbalanced however. It has to be understood that uh, there will be some negative effects of temperature occurring at the same time that uh, CO2 is increasing and uh, for corn the temperature decrease will likely be for a two degree uh, centigrade temperature increase the, the, the likely decrease in yields will be on the order of, of five percent uh, to ten percent likewise for wheat uh, soybean it may not be quite as much and so the co2 fertilization will effectively offset a bit of the temperature uh, declines now that's that's the chronic increase in temperature. Of course, we have to uh, consider not just the, the, the chronic uh, slow-moving uh, temperature increases or environmental change, but also the episodic or things that happen uh, uh, more frequently that are extreme. And uh, that's the big kahuna when we think about climate change and agriculture. That is, if we, uh, we can probably think about adapting to some of the slower changes uh, relatively well, uh, with changes in yields on the order of, of, of four to ten percent uh, maximums, but the increased frequency of extreme events of heat waves in the summer or for uh, perennial crops that bud break for heat waves in the early spring, uh, as well as for periodic droughts, can be quite devastating, especially because those uh, those extreme events don't uh, don't happen everywhere and so the local effects are likely to be uh, even more uh, more devastating for specific uh, specific farmers and uh, particular crops. Um, we see the, uh, the the effects of this will you know, that this is actually uh, also one of the biggest uncertainties is uh, is the effects of these uh, these because we're so uncertain about how much more frequent these events will become. The corn and wheat, for example, are extremely sensitive to heat waves during the reproductive cycle. Um, pollination and fertilization uh, in general is very temperature dependent. Over a certain temperature uh, uh, in corn, pollination simply won't happen. The, the, the pollen will die and the silks that receive the pollen uh, will desiccate and that happens, if that happens during the two-week period that corn is uh, in this phase, uh, it can lead to very, very low uh, rates of grain filling uh, in ears. And uh, likewise, <coughs> in, uh, uh, well, for, for soybean, however, it's not quite as, as uh, soybean is not quite as sensitive to, uh, to those heat, heat, uh, heat waves because pollination occurs over a much longer period. And so uh, if that's the case, then uh, if a heat wave occurs, then it's likely that if it's of, of reasonable duration, 
short duration, then the soybeans will be out of the danger phase by the time uh, they're done with their pollination. Uh, but for some crops like like uh, like corn, which have a very a very narrow uh, range of pollination, then we can expect to have uh, a, a sometimes devastating effect of uh, of, of these heat waves, uh, which will be uh, often localized, but um, sometimes, uh, as we're seeing perhaps this year, uh, much more much more extensive across the uh, across the Midwest. Uh, you said uh, before you mentioned the figure of four to ten percent. Um, that is a, an increase or a decrease in in productivity. Well, that's a, a decrease in productivity yeah. as a as a function of temperature. Right. Right. Uh, so f we figure: uh, is there a rule of thumb productivity loss per degrees of temperature, or is there a threshold that we're looking at? Uh, there is a there is for the chronic temperature increase, and that and that's because the chronic temperature increase is um, is it affects yield by two ways. One is is by speeding the grain filling portion of the development cycle by effectively putting the the, the, the cells metabolic machinery on on steroids. The grain uh, filling uh, doesn't doesn't complete. That is, there's there's uh, typically, when uh, when crops mature, mature and make seed, the carbon is mobilized from other parts of the plants and moved into the grain, uh, where it becomes uh, where it becomes yield. And when that process happens too fast because of increased temperature, there's not enough time for all of the carbon that would otherwise be transported to make it into the grain, and so we have lower yields. And uh, corn and wheat are especially sensitive to this uh, this grain filling. Uh, deficit. The other mechanism is increased nighttime temperatures will increase respiration in the plant. And when a plant spends more of its energy, more of its carbon respiring, it has less energy, less carbon to put into seeds. And so we end up with a, a lower yield because of increased respiration at night. Um, so in, in one sense, the, uh, the fact that we have increasing temperatures um, manifesting themselves mainly at night at this point is a um, uh, it, it, it is it's having a greater effect on on, uh, on on yields perhaps than were that temperature to be uh, were to be occurring during the daytime. Okay, so basically going forward, uh, there's going to be a lot more uncertainty for farmers in general. Yeah, and I, th I think that's that's the major challenge that farmers face. I think uh, dealing with the chronic change will be perhaps difficult in places, but straightforward because we may be able to solve some of those issues with with new genetics or new planting strategies. Um, but dealing with the variability that is expected with the extreme events, with the longer heat waves, with the, uh, the seasonal droughts, uh, and and those sorts of issues, those sorts of events will be, which are much more difficult to predict and much more uh, important in their effects on crops, will be, uh, I think, the probably the hardest aspect of climate change to to anticipate and and adapt to. Okay, great. Well, uh, I really uh, learned a lot from your uh, from your talks during this uh, these few days. So uh, I thank you for for that and for your work. Thanks very much. Okay.